Peaks, dear friends. In the name of the International Solvay Institute, I would like to welcome all of you to the inaugural colloquium of the 2020 New Horizons Le Solvay Lectures in Chemistry, given by Professor Hans Jakob Werner from the ETH in Zurich. The lectures were initially scheduled to take place in the fall of 2020 in Belgium, following the standard in-person in format. Because of the pandemic, however, the schedule had to be adapted. The lectures have been reprogrammed, reprogrammed to 2021 now, and they will take place virtually through Zoom. We hope to organize final lectures in person in 2022. I wish to thank Professor Werner for his great flexibility. We had to reschedule a couple of times the lectures. So this is the third edition of the program New Horizon Solvay Lectures in Chemistry, which started in 2018. The object of this program is to invite a brilliant young scientist with already high visibility and well-established stature to give a series of lectures and to interact with Belgian research teams. That's why it's, it will be important to, to have also the lectures in, in the spring. Now you have all received the program of the three lectures to be given this fall, namely today, in one week, the 12th of October, and in two weeks, the 19th of October. It is a great pleasure to greet Professor Werner already virtually now, hoping that an in-person greeting will be possible in the spring. Well, I think we can be optimistic. I also wish to thank Professor Yves Geertz, who has been instrumental in the invitation of Professor Werner and in the organization of the program. Yves will introduce the speaker and will act as moderator of the session. It's a great pleasure to give him the floor. So thank you very much. So Yves, please. Thank you very much, Mark. So uh, today we have really the great pleasure to, to welcome uh, Professor Hans Jakob Werner. Uh, with a recognized uh, spectroscopist. Uh, he has studied at EPFL and at ETH Zurich and obtained a PhD in 2007. Then he has been postdoc at uh, Laboratoire Aimé Coton of CNRS in Orsay. And after that, he has moved to uh, Canada to, to conduct research uh, with uh, Professor Korkum at uh, Ottawa. Uh, since 2010, he has, he has uh, joined uh, ETH uh, as first assistant professors and then after that as associate professor. Uh, professor Werner is, uh, has obtained a very large number of prizes, awards and grants, of, of which uh, an ERC starting grant in 2012 and an ERC consolidator grant in 2000. 17. So today we will have the pleasure to listen to his first lecture, the first of, of three lectures actually, and these first lectures uh, will be devoted to ultra-fast spectroscopy. So Hans Jakob, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Um, I would like to thank the Solvay Institute um, and their representatives uh, for the great honor to give this lecture series. It, it's a great pleasure uh, to be invited to do this, even though it has to be online. And I would much have preferred to visit uh, you all in Belgium and uh, different universities and several research groups. And I very much look forward to that opportunity. And I hope that in today's lecture, we can bring some of that interactive character back. Uh, by uh, asking questions. So I really invite you to ask any questions you, you would like during the lecture and look also forward to the interaction uh, afterwards. So I will uh, today start with um, the first lecture, which is dedicated to the topic of attosecond charge migration. So that, that is looking into the time scale on which electrons move within molecules. So I, I hope you can all see my screen and also my um, mouse pointer. So the dynamics in molecules cover many orders of magnitude 
uh, ranging down to the attosecond domain uh, where electron motion takes place. And in the realm of quantum dynamics, it is useful to remember this relation. So the period of the dynamics is approximately equal to 4.12 divided by the energy interval in expressing electron volts. So typical UV excitation of molecules gives rise to one femtosecond period dynamics, which is the typical time scale of valence electron dynamics. And one benefit of going to these short time scales is that one can directly observe these electron dynamics, but also that one can, to a large extent, isolate it from uh, the more complex structural dynamics and non adiabatic dynamics that take place in the molecule. But of course, as we will also see during this lecture, the two are strongly coupled and uh, the electronic motion is rarely completely isolated. Access to these very short time scales is the result of decades of research on making ever shorter pulses of light. This slide here shows the evolution of the shortest laser pulses, how they evolved rapidly from 1964 when mode locking was invented down to a duration of about 60, about six femtoseconds in the 1980s. This is a duration where there is only a, a few oscillations of the electric field within a laser pulse. And this progress in, science, in, in laser science gave rise to uh, a new research field, namely femtochemistry, uh, for which Ahmed Zewail was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1999. And during this time, also another very important laser development took place, namely the development of chirp pulse amplification, which was the object of another Nobel Prize in 2018 to uh, Gerard Mourou and Donna Strickland. And this development of chirp pulse amplification really led to this new step in get getting to shorter and shorter pulses, namely the development of attosecond science. And uh, the pulse duration continued to, to decrease uh, crossing the one femtosecond border around 2000. And uh, now we are in a regime where we can make pulses that are as short as about 50 attoseconds. And I will discuss this in a little bit more detail in the third lecture, how to make these short pulses and, uh, and how to improve this further. But first, back to the basics. So how do we generate attosecond pulses? So attosecond pulses are obtained by focusing few femtosecond uh, intense near-infrared uh, fields, laser pulses, onto atoms or molecules. This gives rise to high harmonic generation. And this can be exp expressed in terms of a simple model, the so-called three-step model, introduced by, by Paul Corcom about 30 years ago. Uh, this describes the generation of attosecond pulses in terms of uh, three steps, namely ionization, strong field ionization in the tunneling limit close to the peak of the electric field, followed by acceleration of the electron in the continuum, and then recombination of this electron, all within about two femtoseconds, leading to the generation of an isolated attosecond pulse. Now, when this generation mechanism is realized with very short laser pulses, it is possible to generate isolated attosecond pulses. And uh, here the, the time bandwidth limit applies. So in order to generate um, a pulse of uh, 180 attoseconds, one needs 10 electron volts of bandwidth. So that's, that's a typical order of magnitude. When a high harmonic generation is performed with slightly longer pulses that have more than a single oscillation of the electric field, then a train of attosecond pulses is produced. And this train of attosecond pulses in the frequency domain takes the form of a high harmonic spectrum, namely a spectrum that contains all the odd multiples of the driving frequency of the laser. And in this talk, I will be uh, discussing both, both cases. So uh, both the multi-cycle case where one makes use of high harmonic spectra and their interpretation and the use of isolated attosecond pulses, where one uh, uses the broad bandwidth that is available to perform the measurements. So with these attosecond pulses, a lot of different experiments have been done. And 
new techniques are being uh, continuously developed. This is an, an overview of the time scales that can be accessed and that have been studied uh, from a recent review article. And in this talk, I will be mainly focusing on coherent electron dynamics, but also their interplay with structural dynamics, nuclear motion. And the two techniques I will be discussing are uh, high harmonic spectroscopy. This is also known as self probing, where one uses the mechanism of high harmonic generation in a molecule to extract attosecond dynamics taking place between ionization and recombination. And in the second part of the talk, I will discuss transient absorption using attosecond pulses, another technique where one uses isolated attosecond pulses generated in an external source to probe the dynamics of a system. Then next week, uh, as a brief preview, I will be discussing attosecond photoelectron interferometry, another technique which is the one that reaches the highest time resolution that can be achieved in current measurements. So today I will be first focusing on high harmonic spectroscopy. So in high harmonic spectroscopy, we use intense laser pulses to generate high harmonics in the sample of interest. And then we use uh, advanced optical techniques to characterize the amplitude and the phase and the polarization of the XUV spectra that are generated in the process. And from, that, from those measurements, we then extract the attosecond dynamics. In uh, attosecond transient absorption, we generate isolated attosecond pulses in a, a rare gas source. And then we use this very well synchronized attosecond pulse and the infrared field to uh, and delay them with respect to each other and focus them on the sample of interest and measure how the absorption of the sample changes as a function of the time delay between the infrared and the attosecond pulse. So these two parts of the talk uh, also address a slightly different uh, but related topics, namely in the first in the first part, I will be discussing how fast charge can move across molecules, looking at attosecond charge migration in the iodoacetylene cation. This is done on a, a time scale of hundreds of attoseconds. Um, and is limited to a duration of about two femtoseconds. And in the second part of the talk, we will be looking again at charge migration, but this time in a neutral molecule, namely in silane, but scanning the delay to longer times and seeing how the motion of the atoms influences this charge migration process. So in chemistry, the traditional way to understand and explain uh, charge transfer is Marcus theory. And Marcos theory is a classical ray theory in which one uh, explains charge transfer as the evolution of a system from uh, a state where the charge is on the donor along a reaction coordinate Q to a, a, a situation where the charge is on the acceptor. And one can formulate a rate constant for this process, uh, which has the typical form of an I ring uh, rate constant and that contains uh, a free energy parameter delta G that contains the Gibbs free energy delta G zero and some reorganization term lambda. And with this uh, extremely successful theory, of course, many charge transfer reactions have been explained and understood and designed to uh, reach optimal uh, conditions. Charge transfer indeed plays a, an important role in many areas of both natural and synthetic processes, namely in photosynthesis or in photovoltaics, and also in, in molecular electronics, uh, charge, my, charge transfer plays an important role. So what these processes all have in common is that the charge follows the motion of the nuclei. So the rearrangement is primarily a structural one in nature and uh, the electronic character adapts adiabatically in many cases and uh, describes the transfer of charge. Uh, but about 25 years ago, uh, some experiments have been done by Weinkauf and Schlag on uh, small peptides in the gas phase. And they have found that uh, after ionizing the peptide at a specific point, namely at the aromatic group in this case, they observed the very specific fragmentation of the molecule. 
And this could not be explained with uh, traditional rate theories. Instead, a different mechanism has been invoked, which became known as charge migration. And indeed, charge migration has then been studied in, in great detail uh, theoretically. Uh, and, and one example is shown here, namely following sudden ionization of a molecule, a superposition of more than one electronic state can be created. And this coherent superposition then gives rise to the migration of the electron hole across the molecule in just a few femtoseconds or even less, controlled by the energy level separation of these two states. And indeed, there have been very uh, beautiful predictions here, one by uh, Francoise Rolmark and Rafi Levin, where they show that uh, following ionization of a peptide, one can expect that the, the electron hole uh, migrates across the molecule in less than a femtosecond and then returns at the old original position. So this is a different mechanism compared to charge transfer because this happens on a purely electronic time scale and it even happens without the nuclei moving. And in order to get charge migration, one can formulate uh, two necessary conditions, namely at least two electronic states must be coherently populated and the two electronic wave functions, they must have some spatial overlap. And this one can illustrate these conditions using the uh, H2 plus as the simplest, simplest molecular system. Um, namely, this is a, a graphical representation of the wave functions of the ground state and the first excited state of H2 plus. And one can form a coherent superposition of these two states and then calculate the time dependent electron density that comes from this superposition state. And one finds that uh, it, with this particular superposition state, the electron starts on the left atom and then moves to the right atom in just 174 attoseconds. And for fixed nuclei, this is a periodic motion uh, that goes on forever. So one can contrast the mechanisms, namely uh, what is traditionally referred to as, as charge transfer is the, the evolution of the system uh, from an initial state with charge on the donor to a final state with charge on the acceptor. Whereas in charge migration, we are looking at a coherent superposition of two electronic states with uh, some relative amplitude and relative phase. And uh, the charge can move between donor acceptor on an electronic time scale. And Looking forward, one can now wonder what is the effect of electronic coherence on the charge transfer process itself, namely how does this coherent superposition influence uh, the crossing of the intersection between these potential energy surfaces. And this is the area that is commonly referred to as atochemistry nowadays. And I will return to this uh, at the end of the lecture. So first, I will now uh, focus on and one experimental and theoretical study that uh, we have published a few years ago, which was a close collaboration with uh, the group of Francoise Remarque, André Bondrock, and Lars Madsen. It's uh, a joint experimental and theoretical study where we used uh, experimental methods, namely we fixed molecules in space, this is called orientation, and we used high harmonic generation spectroscopy to measure the amplitude and the phase of high harmonic emission. And from these measurements, with the help of uh, certain theoretical models, we were then able to reconstruct the relative population and the relative phase as a function of time. Uh, and from that, derive the spatial structure of the electron hole as a function of time. So the main concept in these experiments is the mapping of transit time to photon energy. And this is an important concept that has been established in high harmonic spectroscopy for some time. And it comes from the fact that um, photon energies that are measured can be mapped directly to specific transit time of the electron between ionization and recombination. And in these experiments, one can think of the strong field ionization acting as the pump, initiating the dynamics one wants to study, and then the electron recombination acting as the probe encoding the dynamics one wants to see into the polarization or the phase, the amplitude of the harmonic emission. And so one can understand different photon energies as reflecting 
different amount of time, transit time, that have elapsed between ionization and recombination. So to realize this experimentally, we used a two-color laser field, in this case, a superposition of 800 and 400 nanometer fields to orient molecules in space, and then waited for one rotational period of the molecule, which allowed us to interrogate an ensemble of molecules oriented in space by high harmonic generation. We then used uh, laser fields with two different wavelengths, 800 nanometer to interrogate early transient times and 1300 nanometer to interrogate later transit times. So in this molecule, strong field ionization prepares a coherent superposition of two electronic states, namely the ground state and the first excited state. But depending on how the molecule is oriented with respect to the laser field, one can realize two limiting cases. Namely, when the molecule is perpendicular to the field, there is almost no stark shift and almost no population transfer between the states, such that the evolution of the cation is identical or very close to field-free evolution. Then recombination of the electrons with the two possible states encodes the dynamics that have taken place in the high harmonic spectrum. In contrast, when the molecule is parallel to the laser field, then there is a strong coupling that takes place and there is population transfer between the two states. Um, and this leads to a different situation where the laser field uh, interacts strongly or modifies uh, charge migration. So in the measurements, what we look at is first just the intensity of the harmonic emission. And we are comparing high harmonic emission from molecules parallel to the field and molecules perpendicular to the field. Um, and these plots show the relative intensity, so the intensity for aligned divided by anti-aligned molecules uh, at two different wavelengths. And the important result is that we find the minimum in this ratio, which occurs at different photon energies for the two wavelengths. And this is a first indication that um, in these measurements, we are probing the system in a different state, namely at at 800 nanometer, we are probing the system at earlier times compared to the longer wavelengths where we are interrogating later times. And indeed, the, the, the difference in the properties of high harmonic emission, they come from the dynamics that have taken place between ionization and recombination. So this is one aspect, namely the amplitude measurement, but we also need another observable, namely the phase of harmonic emission. And the phase can be measured in a variant of the Young double slit experiment. So here, instead of uh, using a signal focus to generate the high harmonics, we uh, use an optical technique to generate harmonics in two foci. And the harmonic emission from these two foci then interferes in the far field, as one can see here, giving rise to um, interference fringes like in the double slit experiment. And now by superimposing the align alignment laser, we can align the molecules in one source and let them randomly align in the other source, which allows us to follow how these fringes move up and down on the detector as we rotate the molecule in space. And this allows us to measure phase as a function of angle, which is another observable that contains information about the charge migration dynamics. Now, in order to extract the information from these measurements, we formulated uh, a theoretical model here, which takes into account uh, the, the, the processes of ionization, propagation, and recombination. And using three experimental observables per photon energy, namely relative amplitude, relative phase, and the even to odd high harmonic ratio, and some input from calculations, namely photo recombination matrix elements, and the angular variation of the strong field ionization rates, we were able to extract um, the relevant quantities, namely the relative population of the two states of the cation and their relative phase for each photon energy that we can map to transit time. And because we have three observables and only two quantities, the problem is overdetermined, which allows us to also extract the relative population and phase at the time zero, meaning at the time of ionization which we will refer to as the shape of the hole at the moment of ionization. And so these are the results we obtained from this work. Namely, we reconstructed the relative population amplitudes of the X and A states, which are in reasonable agreement with 
uh, first principle calculations. And we also extracted the relative phase of the two states. And that relative phase uh, allows us to reconstruct the shape of the electron hole using calculated orbitals. In the case of molecules aligned perpendicular to the field, we find that the hole is on the iodine atom initially and then evolves, whereas in the case of parallel molecules, we find that the hole is initially created on the acetylene side of the molecule. And this uh, result is quite unexpected at first sight, at least it was for us. And so we, we looked into the details. Why is the formation of the electron hole so sensitive to the molecular orientation? And it turns out this can be very nicely explained, namely when the molecule is aligned perpendicular to the laser field, then the um, electronic states, X and A, they are almost independent in energy of the field strengths. So there is no Stark effect uh, that plays a role. Whereas when the molecule is parallel to the laser field, then we have a strong Stark effect and we have a strong mixing of the two states, which gives rise to uh, a lowest lying state in the electric field where the electron hole is localized on the acetylene side. And so this is this explains indeed the experimental result. Namely, we are creating the uh, most stable, the lowest adiabatic state in the electric field. And so with, with the results at hand, we can now reconstruct the evolution of this electron hole as a function of time. So the electron hole starts on the iodine atom, then moves across the molecule in just under one femtosecond and then keeps oscillating. And the measurement we have done here covers these two first femtoseconds. Um, it does not extend further because uh, th this is limited by the length of the electron trajectories available in these, with these driving fields. So in addition to looking at the field-free evolution of uh, the, the charge, we can also look at the effect of the laser electric field. So this is not, these are now measurements done for molecules parallel to the laser field. And we again reconstruct the relative phase shown on top here and the relative amplitude shown on the bottom. And the most important uh, aspect is the phase measurement. And this phase stays nearly constant as a function of transit time in this case. In the field-free case, this phase evolves linearly uh, as a function of time due to the energy gap between the two states. And now we can compare here uh, the evolution of the hole in the quasi field free case on the left and the laser controlled or laser influenced case on the right. And so uh, these are the, the accessible transit times. And as you can see, there is a continuous uh, motion of the electron hole from acetylene to iodine during this interval in the field free case. But in the laser controlled case, there is almost no evolution of the hole. The hole stays on the acetylene. I will play this again. So in the field-free case, you can see the hole migrates to the iodine side and starts appearing here. Whereas during the same time interval, there is no visible evolution of the hole in the laser control case. And so this shows that uh, one can use laser fields to modify or influence charge migration. In this case, uh, it is unavoidable because the measurement is done in a strong field for the molecules aligned parallel to the field. But it shows that laser fields can be used to suppress or slow down charge migration. Now, turning to the, the uh, uh, longer wavelengths, 1300 nanometer, we find that both the population and the phase, they vary significantly during the measured interval. And especially the phase shows a jump around 1.7 femtoseconds. And this jump corresponds to a rapid motion of the electron hole, uh, which corresponds to a situation where the laser field is leading to a rapid change of the electron hole configuration. So here again, on the left, we see the continuous evolution. So the hole slowly migrates from acetylene to iodine. And we see in the, at the same time, uh, there is a much more rapid evolution of the electron hole when it is influenced by the laser field. So, here in the laser control case, it starts on the iodine side and then rapidly moves to the acetylene side much more quickly than in the field free uh, evolution case. So this example shows that laser fields can also be used to accelerate charge migration. So to conclude this part, um, we have 
shown that one can use harmonic spectroscopy to reconstruct attosecond charge migration with a resolution of about 100 attoseconds, and that the molecular orientation defines both the initial conditions of charge migration, what we refer to as the shape of the hole, and that it can also influence uh, the charge migration uh, in a strong way. And indeed, this is something that can be used in future work to show that one can control charge migration and modify it uh, by using strong laser fields. Now, these measurements were done uh, on the iodoacetylene molecule, but uh, more recently we have moved to uh, different uh, molecules, namely uh, to chiral molecules, and it is also possible to obtain detailed information uh, about the evolution of uh, charge migration in chiral molecules. This is an example where we used uh, circularly polarized 1800 and 900 nanometer fields counter rotating. So they describe uh, a well defined rotation direction in space. And this can be used to discriminate the enantiomers of chiral molecules. This gives rise to a large chiral discrimination up to about 10% which extends over wide ranges of photon energy. And um, from such measurements, with the help of uh, calculations, one can reconstruct the uh, electron hole migration um, and again, obtain detailed pictures of how this charge migration evolves on an attosecond time scale. So if you would like to uh, read more about this, we have written two review articles, one in Structural Dynamics in 2017 and one in Angewandte Chemie in 2018, uh, which cover these topics and also relate them to uh, charge transfer processes. Now, there have been very beautiful other experiments on charge migration also, and, and one I would like to, measure in, uh, to mention in particular is uh, an experiment done in 2014 on the phenylalanine cation. Here, uh, an attosecond pulse was used to ionize the system, and then a strong infrared field was used to ionize the system again. And looking at the doubly charged uh, ammonium cation, um, people observed an oscillation in the yield of this cation with a period of about four femtoseconds. And this is also evidence uh, of charge migration. And what is interesting is that this charge migration was found to live for a uh, long time, so here more than 35 femtoseconds. And this charge migration was then uh, a assigned in a fixed nuclear calculation to particular types of electronic dynamics within the molecule. Um, and this uh, explains nicely the, the experimental observations. Uh, now, in, in the meantime, uh, a few calculations have been done uh, by several uh, theory groups, which looked more in more detail at the influence of nuclear motion. And the, the nuclear motion is uh, modulating the energy level separation between different electronic states. And in the case of the phenylalanine cation, although for a different set of electronic states, it was found that the electronic coherence can also decay within less than two femtoseconds. Uh, and this would essentially correspond to a situation where the charge migration is stopped. And there are other uh, calculations that go in the same direction, namely uh, on the paraxylene cation shown here or the bismethylene adamantane cation. In both cases, it was found that the electronic coherence can be strongly suppressed by nuclear motion um, and can decay within only a few femtoseconds. Now, Similar calculations have also been done on the iodoacetylene cation. And in this case, it was found that charge migration, which is indeed created by ionization, as I discussed quite uh, in detail, this charge migration can also disappear because of nuclear motion. So in the case of the iodoacetylene cation, uh, the, the ground state and the first excited state of the cation support nuclear wave packet uh, motion in opposite directions. This leads to a loss of overlap between these nuclear wave packets, which leads to a suppression or decoherence of charge migration within 10 femtoseconds. So this is something that could not be accessed in our measurements because we, uh, they were limited to the first two femtoseconds. But of course, this is something that one would like to be able to measure. 
And moreover, in addition to the, the decoherence of charge migration, this work predicted a revival of charge migration about, uh, at about 80 to 90 femtoseconds. So in order to uh, have access to such measurements or to such uh, processes, we uh, would turn to a different method, namely to attosecond transient absorption spectroscopy. Because the advantage here is that we can tune the time delay between the pump pulse here, in this case, again, strong field excitation by an IR field, and the pro pulse, and which in this case is an isolated attosecond pulse. We also turn to a different molecule, to silane, for technical reasons. Um, and we use this configuration now uh, to study the change in uh, the absorption spectrum of the silane molecule. This was uh, a collaboration with uh, the group of Alexander Kulev and uh, Nikolai Golubev, who did uh, all the calculations that I will discuss. So in, in, in this case, we are now using uh, a strong field pu pu uh, pulse to excite the molecule. There is some ionization taking place, but this uh, gives rise to spectral signatures in a different uh, range. So we are interested in the strong field excitation of the molecule. And we find that strong field excitation creates a superposition of two electronic states. And then these uh, coherence is probed by transient absorption from a core level, namely the 2p orbital of the silicon atom. And this is done by measuring the absorption of an uh, isolated attosecond X-ray pulse. So the, the black line here on top is the static absorption spectrum of, of the silane molecule. We can uh, identify a region where we have valence absorption and Rydberg absorption just below the L2 and L3 edges at around 106 electron volts. And we can now in this measurement study uh, the change in optical absorption of the system as a function of the pump probe delay. This is shown here as a, a color map. So blue is negative, red is positive. And what I would like to draw your attention to is these oscillations that are present here at early times, magnified on the right here. So between zero and 10 femtosecond, we see a 1.3 femtosecond oscillation of that absorption. And then it, this absorption disappears, the, the modulation disappears, and it reappears between 40 and 50 femtoseconds, as shown in this inset here. And so, as I will discuss now, these um, correspond to decoherence of charge migration and the revival of charge migration, both caused by nuclear motion in this system. And so to uh, assign the experimental results, we performed a Fourier transform of this uh, absorption as a function of time. This gives the Fourier frequency on the vertical axis, and the photon energy is still shown on the horizontal axis. Now, by comparing where these uh, the peaks in the Fourier transform appear with the static absorption spectrum, we can assign the upper state to the 5s Rydberg state. So this is excitation of an electron from the HOMO into the 5s orbital of the molecule. Um, these peaks, they are not isolated, but they come in pairs. Namely, this has to be the case if we create a superposition of two electronic states. We have to see a beating with a given uh, frequency nu, and this must be related to a well-defined photon energy interval. And so using these peaks in the Fourier spectrum as reference and drawing vert vertical lines, we can draw the corresponding position that where we, we would expect the corresponding uh, peak of the Fourier transform to appear. And indeed, we can see that along these oblique lines, for each strong peak shown on in this region, we have another strong peak that is almost exactly aligned where it should be. And so this allows us to assign pairwise these coherences to uh, electronic states that are separated by 3.1 electron volts or 1.3 femtoseconds. And so there, we can say there are two groups of coherences, this one here corresponding to um, an, a coherence between a valence state and a Rydberg state, and one, uh, uh, a frequency, uh, another coherence here corresponding to a different interval. And based on the position of these photon of these peaks with respect to the absorption spectrum, we can directly assign the electronic configuration of the states that are involved. And so we can, we can conclude 
on a purely experimental basis that the upper state that is being populated is this 5A1 or 5S Rydberg state, and the lower states are the two valence excited states that gives rise to this broad absorption feature. And so, so purely from the experiment, we can extract these configurations. Now, um, with the help of calculation, we can also assign these configurations to specific states. Namely, we find the upper state is the, so the state we call C. It's the 5S Rydberg state. The lower state is the valence excited 4A1 peak. And uh, the, the third, so, so the other lower lying valence state is a dark state. It doesn't have oscillator strengths. And this will play a role in the later discussion. So initially, we prepare the B and C states coherently. And this gives rise to the main oscillation. So this gives rise to the charge migration, which gives this oscillation. This oscillation decays in about 10 femtoseconds. And then it revives. It has a delayed maximum around between 40 and 50 femtoseconds. And this observation is then confirmed by the, the calculation done by uh, Alexander Kulev, uh, Nikolai Golubev, and Victor Depré. And they found indeed that the electronic coherence that is initially prepared decays in about 10 femtoseconds and then shows a revival around 50 femtoseconds, just slightly later than in the experimental prediction. And one can now use this understanding to reconstruct the shape of this charge migration. It is mainly a, a radial charge migration uh, because it involves a compact valence state and a more diffuse Rydberg state. And it gives rise to this breezing of the charge density uh, shown here. So the, the density moves from the inner part of the molecule to the outer part in about 690 attoseconds. And this is the main. Uh, effect that is measured. But as you can see in these calculations, there is also another coherence which is not present at time zero, but which appears slightly delayed, the AC coherence. And this we will discuss uh, in a minute. So first, why do we see this decoherence and recoherence of the, the charge migration? This can be nicely explained in terms of uh, nuclear wave packet dynamics. And this is a nice movie made by Nikolai Golubev where one can see what happens. So at time zero, when the excitation takes place, the nuclear wave packets in the two states are well aligned. There is strong electronic coherence. But then as time uh, elapses, the nuclear wave packets move apart from each other. This suppresses the coherence. But then around 50 femtoseconds, they come back in phase. And this gives rise to the revival uh, of the charge migration. So I, I will play it again and stop it at 50 femtoseconds. So here they move apart. As you can see, this suppresses the electronic coherence. But then here around 50 femtoseconds, they come back in phase. And this gives rise to the revival. And yeah, yeah. now we play it again. So this. Uh, uh, explains what, what I, I just said in more detail. So the top here shows the autocorrelation. We see how the, the C uh, wave packet moves very regularly, like almost a harmonic oscillator, whereas the B wave packet has more complicated dynamics. And the two uh, come back together around 50 femtoseconds. This minimizes uh, the separation in coordinate space and in momentum space and gives rise to maximum overlap that gives rise to the revival uh, of the charge migration. And so this, these calculations explain uh, what we observe, namely the decoherence and the revival of the charge migration are a direct consequence of the nuclear wave packet dynamics in the two states. Now, I mentioned that the initially prepared coherence BC does not stay alone. It gives rise to a second coherence at slightly higher frequency, namely the AC coherence. And this can also be explained uh, by the calculations, namely the initial superposition state BC evolves into a superposition state AC because the lower the wave packet in the lower state has non adiabatic crossing to the lower lying state through a conical intersection. This occurs very fast. It takes only about seven femtoseconds to transfer a significant fraction of the population. And this uh, apparently can preserve the electronic coherence giving rise to the higher frequency coherence that is observed in, in the experimental data. And translating this into charge migration, what it means is 
that the initially created radial charge uh, migration shown here evolves into a different type of charge migration, namely the angular charge migration as a consequence of uh, the conical intersection crossing in the lower lying uh, electronic states. And so one can now uh, summarize this. So using the experimental observations and the theoretical uh, model, one can construct um, a complete representation of what this charge uh, migration looks like uh, in space. So um, at time zero, this is the difference of the electron density of the excited molecule minus the unexcited molecule. And one can look at how this uh, difference density evolves as a function of time. At early times, we have this strong radial charge migration. Then we have the dephasing or decoherence of the charge migration. There is only little uh, amplitude. One can see the, both the radial and the angular charge migration, but they are both weak. And around 50 femtosecond, the charge migration comes back. And there is a very strong change in the uh, electron density which is again dominated by the radial charge migration. Um, and so this gives uh, an overview of what uh, the effect of nuclear motion is on charge migration. And remarkably, it shows that the, the electronic coherence can indeed survive for, for, uh, for long times. So to, to summarize this part, um, I hope I convince you that uh, the coherence and revival of charge migration have been observed in the silane molecule. And we found that electronic coherence can survive for long times, at least 100 femtoseconds, even in a dense manifold of strongly coupled electronic states. And uh, also the comparison of experiment and theory suggests that electronic coherence can be transferred through conical intersections. Now, to conclude both parts uh, of the talk, um, as a community, uh, we now have experimental and theoretical methods that allow us to prepare charge migration in molecular cations, also in neutral molecules. We can reconstruct charge migration in amplitude and phase, and we can observe the interplay of charge migration and nuclear dynamics. And finally, uh, we have some evidence that we can control charge migration with strong laser fields. And this naturally leads to the question what comes next? Uh, the, the term atochemistry has, has been used by a few people already. And um, I would like now to return to this uh, concept of atochemistry and give a brief outlook based on theoretical uh, calculations that have been made. So to come back to the uh, sketch that I made earlier to compare charge migration and, and uh, charge transfer, uh, it is now interesting to understand what is the role of electronic coherences in such situations, generally in intersecting potential energy surfaces, but particularly also in the case of charge transfer. So what is the role of electronic coherence? How does it affect how the way that uh, wave packets cross conical intersection? Can we use this to control how such reactions take place? And this is this is the field of atochemistry. And there have indeed been a, a few very nice predictions of what one can hope to achieve with atochemistry. So for example, this is a, a theoretical study of uh, how the, the phase of an electronic superposition state can control nuclear dynamics. So in this work, it was shown that when uh, toluene is prepared only in the ground state or only in the first excited state of the cation, the nuclear dynamics is different from the case when an electronic superposition state is created. And in this case, motion can be orthogonal uh, to the nuclear motion that takes place adiabatically in the two states. Um, also on a slightly more complex system here, the, the uracil molecule, it has been shown that by creating well-chosen electronic superposition states, one can control conical intersection dynamics in uracil and modify the way how wave packets move on these coupled potential energy surfaces. Um, then it has also been shown in a, a study by, by Francois Remarque that using the carrier envelope phase of the laser pulse, one can modify the branching ratio between the different dissociation channel of the LIH molecule, changing the situation from dominant 3s plus 1s 
to dominant 3p plus 1s dissociation. And so this, this is yet again an example of how one can use laser pulses to influence electronic dynamics that then have an influence on uh, the nuclear dynamics that follow. And uh, most recently, this study has shown that one can use uh, shaped ultraviolet pulses to act again on electronic superposition states and in this way uh, control, in this case, bond formation. And this is really now uh, bringing together atosecond science and, and chemistry. So showing perspectives how one can use electronic coherence to modify chemical reactions and perhaps induce or enhance chemical reactions that are difficult to achieve uh, otherwise without the use of electronic coherence. And so with this, I would like to, to close and thank all the people who contributed to this work. Uh, uh, people in my group who did the measurements that I discussed, but also the collaborators um, who contributed greatly uh, to, to these results, namely uh, the first group of collaborators on the study of the iodoacetylene cation and the second group of collaborators on the study of the silane molecule. And with this, I would like to uh, conclude here and thank you very much for your attention. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much for this uh, fascinating talk, but um, uh, really short um, uh, time scales. Um, there are, I see that there are some questions. So, who wants to start? I would say, well, I see some ends. Mm -hmm. No one? Okay, yeah. I have a question, if I may. Yes. Um, Professor Werner, um, you showed the molecule vertically and horizontally uh, with respect to the impeding uh, electric field. Um, what happens in between? What happens when it is not vertical? What happens when it is not horizontal? Mm -hmm. yes, this yes. is a nice question because uh, I have been working before with uh, François Vermakler, and then I entered a bit as well these excited states in biological environments. And then this uh, is photoselection. Yeah. And so that should be the second Legendre polynomial. Do you have, uh, did you look at anything in between these two? Yes, yes, we did. So um, in, in the results I showed, I simplified it to the two limiting cases, parallel and perpendicular. In the experiment, in reality, we have to deal with the cases in between because the alignment is never perfect. So there is always a finite axis distribution. And so in the experiment, we always have contributions from molecules that are not exactly parallel or perpendicular. But um, we, we take this into account because we know how the situation evolves from parallel to perpendicular, right? In, in the perpendicular case, you have no coupling, no population transfer. Everything is field-free, like under field-free condition. In the parallel case, you're in the opposite limit. You have strong population transfer. And in between, you, you can still uh, describe the population dynamics, but you have to take into account that you are now at a given angle. But there is an, you, you can do it analytically even. You, you can calculate the, the, the population evolution of the cation driven by the field uh, analytically. I see. And this is also published. I can find this. Yes, yeah, yeah. You, 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 can, you can find it in the supplementary material. This is discussed how, how we deal with the cases in between. But in short, you, you can say these are uh, field-driven oscillations, these Rabi oscillations, essentially. Right. And for Rabi oscillation, there is an analytical, uh, well, no, th there, is a, th there is an approximate analytical formula, but that is very close to the exact uh, uh, numerical result. It's done in, okay, the rotating, in the rotating wave approximation, it's exact. Understand, thank you. Okay, some other questions? Well, then I have a very simple one. How do you select the molecular systems that you study? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, so in the, the two studies I showed, the, the choice was uh, guided by the experimental possibilities. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, we we took iodoacetylene because uh, it 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 has um, a strong anisotropy of the polarizability, so you can align it very well. And uh, it's a linear molecule, so it's enough to align one axis. You don't have to align three axes. Um, and in the case of the silane molecule, we chose it because we had the, the, the best spectral and temporal resolution in that area of 100 electron volts. But we are currently working on doing similar measurements at 300 electron volts, where the, the, the core level transitions of carbon lie. And this will release this uh, uh, restriction. So we deliberately chose that molecule for technical reasons. But now, in the next months and years, we uh, should be able to generalize this to uh, any molecule containing carbon, nitrogen, or oxygen. Mm -hmm. OK, but I guess the, the size of the molecules is quite limited, because the molecules must remain in gas phase. Yes. So um, the, the size certainly plays a role. So more so in high harmonic spectroscopy, where we have to rely on uh, accurate models in order to extract the full information we want. In X-ray spectroscopy, this restriction is relieved because uh, X-ray spectra are simpler to interpret than valence spectra because uh, of the elements are, uh, occur in different regions. So we have access to element-specific transitions. Um, and X-ray spectroscopy is also well-developed for more complex systems. Um, then the gas phase uh, is partially a restriction, at the, especially at the low photon energy, so up to about 150 electron volts. These measurements uh, can mainly be done in the gas phase. Also, some work has been done on solids. But um, at higher photon energies, it's possible to do these measurements in solution uh, because water becomes transparent. And so it's possible to uh, do measurements like uh, X-ray up to second transient absorption it's possible to realize them in solution. And this is something we are intensively working on. And uh, it's the subject of the third lecture I will give, where I will show some examples of solvated molecules. Mm -hmm. OK. And, 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 and then when you talk of, of charge migration, what is the, to your understanding, what is the limit of the size the systems uh, I mean, because the, the, the electron move over a very short distance. Could we extend that to longer distance? Yes, yes, definitely. I, I think the, the, this is definitely a, a process that should occur in larger systems. There are uh, at least theoretical predictions that, that suggest that this is possible. Um, for example, the, 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 the peptide, the tetrapeptide, um, mm -hmm. Uh, where you have tryptophan, leucine, leucine, leucine. This is a, an early calculation uh, by Francois Remac and, and Raph Levin. They showed that the electron hole can move from one end to the other uh, in a relatively extended system. But the, the question of the role of nuclear dynamics becomes correspondingly more significant because if you have so many degrees of freedom and, and each of these degrees of freedom can contribute somewhat to the decoherence, then there are uh, predictions or expectations that this will lead to shorter decoherence time in larger systems. Mm -hmm. But this does not need to be really a, a strict rule. It's just a trend. The trend is in larger systems, probably decoherence will be faster and probably such revivals as discussed in the case of silane, they are less likely to occur just because you don't get this nice re uh, coherence or the, 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 the regain of spatial overlap and momentum overlap at the same time. Okay. But you know this this is speculating. We don't know. We have to do the measurements and, and find out. Maybe there are exam that there are exceptions. Okay. Thank you. I think that uh under it has a question. Yes, so forgive my, uh, I'm very naive because I'm not at all in that field, but I was just wondering how difficult it is for a new group to, 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 to try, uh, to start such experiments. I mean, how complex is the experimental setup to, to be designed or if a new group wants to start, I mean, how complex it is to, to have these facilities? 
Yes, so I would say uh, it's comparably complex. So compared to typical physical chemistry experiments, uh, it's technologically quite demanding because uh, one needs lasers that are very stable and ideally that are carry envelope phase stable. And, and this already is a significant investment. Mm -hmm. but then this is not enough. One needs to build pulse compression to get short pulses. And then one needs vacuum chambers to generate the high harmonics and, and, and perform the measurements. So I would say the, the, it is quite challenging to, to build up this infrastructure uh, from scratch. And uh, so, so this is a bit the reason also behind the, the technology that we changed in our group over the years, because in the early years, we were mainly doing high harmonic spectroscopy, which is comparably not so difficult, right? You, you don't need isolated attosecond pulses and you don't, you don't need uh, very high photon energies. It's relatively simple. It's on in the typical time scale uh, and, and complexity scale of physical chemistry experiments. But then doing soft X-ray at a second experiments, this is becoming really complicated. And it, it took us the better part of 10 years to, to, to develop this infrastructure. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? If no, I still have one. Uh, I have not understood uh, how, how you succeeded to, to, to discriminate between enantiomers. Ah. Oh, yeah. Yes, good question. So I can quickly go back to the slide, perhaps. So this is um, due to the fact that the electric field in these experiments, oh, I'm sorry, jump back to the last slide for some reason. Yes, so we use um, 800, 1800 and 900 nanometer fields, which are counter rotating in space as, mm -hmm. uh, as shown here. And when we superimpose these two laser fields, ah. the electric field uh, describes this uh, clover leaf, but it has a well-defined sense of rotation in space. And when this field interacts with one enantiomer, the, the harmonic yield is a little bit lower than when it interacts with the other enantiomer because there is a chiral sensitivity. It's a chiral electric field interacting with a chiral molecule. And this interaction is chiral sensitive. And then if we reverse the electric field, we do it the opposite way. That's the situation here. Then the relative intensity is opposite, right? Now the S enantiomer gives more intensity, which before gave less. And the R enantiomer gives less. And so, then if you, if you take the difference of the two, you find the anti-symmetry. So it's the chirality of the electric field interacting with the chirality of the molecule that give you the, the chiral signature. OK, thank you. If I may still have a question, uh, Professor Heert. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, you, men you mentioned um, that you did measurements in water. Uh, what happens if I change the environment, if I change to ethanol, if I change to say something else, uh, say a biological uh, environment, right? Uh, what would change to your um, uh, interactions to your uh, ultra fast uh, phenomena? Yes, that, that's an excellent question. And it's for me very difficult to answer at the moment because we are at the very beginning of these experiments, but uh, we, we find quite significant changes. So just to, to mention one result I will discuss in two weeks, when you compare uh, photofragmentation in the gas phase and the liquid phase, uh, we found in that specific case on the pyridine cation that in the gas phase, you can get fragmentation, whereas in the liquid phase, fragmentation is suppressed. And we think this is because you dissipate energy sufficiently fast that you can suppress the dissociation. But th this is just one example uh, on a, a tens of femtosecond time scale. There are many other open questions like uh, how long uh, electronic coherences live if you have an environment, probably less long than in the gas phase, but maybe you know, the, the coupling to the environment doesn't play such a big role on, on, on one or two femtosecond time scale. We don't know yet. Uh, and but th these are the interesting questions that this research field can address in the future. 
Yeah, I'm a bit afraid of the uh, in, induction in, induced uh, effects, which you cannot have on this time scale. And then I'm a bit puzzled. <laughs> yes. yeah. uh, interesting. Thanks. Thank you. So I have to uh, try to quickly uh, calculate an order of magnitude at which uh, rate the electron move when when it, when it is when the electron is oscillating from one atom to the other one. And, and I arrived to, to, to the uh, figure that about 10 kilometers per second. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, it, perhaps I, my calculation is wrong, but this is rather fast. Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, of course, this type of views are, are, are not appropriate anymore to the quantum field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, often the classical picture gives a good guide of, mm -hmm. of what is what is happening. And yes, I, I think these these speeds they they can even be faster if the energy separation becomes larger. Here, here mm -hmm. we are, we're dealing with typical valence uh, energy separations, but. In, in quantum mechanics, we expect that the, this, this period becomes shorter and shorter as we go to larger intervals. So for example, when we start looking at core electrons, dynamics can in, should in principle be even faster than that. Mm -hmm. And if we look at an extended molecule uh, uh, and, and we look at two states that are, are, have amplitudes that are far apart from each other, then we, we can also expect that these speeds can go even higher than what we saw now in these in these examples. Mm -hmm. But indeed, it would be interesting to develop some uh, intuitive understanding of how fast these electron dynamics are without doing uh, involved calculations. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah. yeah. Are there other questions? If no more question. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't font the, the little hands. So uh, if I can just ask a question like that. Sure. Um, so it's a, a long time now that we are, um, that we heard about the possibility to have a control in the ATO second field. But for the moment, experimentally, there is at least at my knowledge, there is nothing. So do you know what is exactly the, the bottleneck there? Because there are control, of course, in, in other fields uh, for molecules uh, in vibration and so on and so forth, but nothing in the, the very fast uh, regime for the atosegund field. So what exactly is, is the problem experimentally? Because mm -hmm. theoretically, there is plenty of, uh, of study, of course. Yes, Ex I think it's, it's an excellent question. I think the main hurdle is uh, experimental complexity. So um, in principle, one can modify the, the phase, the spectral phase of an atosecond pulse. This has been shown in experiments. And in, in principle, one can use that to do control experiments. Um, now, not much has been done exactly as you say in this direction. And, and I would say it's mainly technological or, or experimental complexity. But I would like to mention one, one example that is very interesting in this regard. And this is an experiment that has been done at the, the Fermi free electron laser, where people did pulse shaping experiments so they, they were able to change the relative phase uh, of different harmonics, in this case, the harmonics of the, the free electron laser. And they use this to uh, control the photo emission direction of electrons from, from atoms. So I think this is one of the first examples of uh, attosecond coherent control. So using the relative phase of attosecond pulses to demonstrate control. Now, this is an ionization experiment um, because the, the attosecond pulses have short uh, wavelengths, so, so they tend to ionize systems. And this is also uh, a fundamental uh, challenge because when one ionizes the system and one has a, a photoelectron that leaves, then uh, the degree of control exerted on the ion is, is less, right? Because uh, the electron and the ion can be entangled to different degrees, and this limits the degree of purity of the, the, the electronic state of the cation. 
And so I think this is another reason why not so many experiments have been done, that one still needs to uh, understand this in detail and then realize an experiment that is not too challenging technically. But I agree with you, it's, it's a really exciting direction and, and that should be pursued. Okay. So I propose to, to thank our speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you for the attention. You only hear me, man, not the others, but. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and so uh, we'll uh, actually uh, come back in a week to, to continue to listen to your interesting lectures. Thank you very much, Hans Jacob. It was a really a pleasure. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. And thank you all for joining. Thank you.